have you with us this evening. So I just want to call this meeting of the uh, Standing Committee on Accountability and Oversight to order. My name is Kevin O'Reilly. I'm the MLA for Frame Lake and chair of the committee. Uh, this evening, committee will receive a public presentation from the Honourable Julie Green, Minister of Health and Social Services, and Dr. Cami Candola, Chief Public Health Officer. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. Uh, I'd like to remind uh, all members and our witnesses that all comments, questions and remarks will need to be directed to myself as the chair. Both members and the witness uh, will need to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking, please. Uh, I'll now ask members to introduce themselves for the record and I'll start with those that are in the room. I'd like to start with Mr. Johnson, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Rylan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Good evening, uh, Lisa Semler, MLA for Anubic Twin Lakes. Okay, Jane Wee Allen, Armstrong, MLA for Mufi. <clears throat> Ron Bonatus, MLA Techo. Rocky Simpson, Hay River South. Thanks, and I believe we have a couple of MLAs who are joining us virtually as well, so um, I'll go to Ms. Knockleby first. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Katrina Knockleby, MLA for Great Slave. Thank you. Good evening, Perfect. We actually got through all of that. Uh, um, I'd like to now invite the uh, Minister of uh, Health and Social Services to uh, introduce her team and uh, um, proceed with any opening remarks that she may have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Good evening to you and to members of the Standing Committee on Accountability and Oversight. Thank you for this opportunity to provide an update on our COVID-19 response. Joining me tonight are Dr. Cami Candola, the Chief Public Health Officer for the Northwest Territories, Dr. Amory Pegg, Territorial Medical Director, Dr. Andy Delapisi, the Deputy Chief Public Health Officer, Scott Robertson, the Director of Public Health and Primary Care, Bruce Cooper, the Deputy Minister of the Department of Health and Social Services, Kim Riles, the Chief Operating Officer of the NPHSSA, Russ Newdorf, the Associate Deputy Minister for the COVID Secretariat, Conrad Bates, the Director of Policy for the COVID Secretariat, and support staff including my MSA, Liz King, the Deputy Minister's MSA, Kate Sills, and the CPHO's uh, Senior Advisor, Carter Sterling. This evening, we will focus on the response to the recent outbreak that began in mid-August. For much of the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to avoid the most serious effects of the virus because of the travel restrictions, self-isolation requirements, and gathering orders that are in place. Prior to August, most COVID-19 infections in the NWT were imported by travel resulting in sporadic cases, although we did have an outbreak of 70 cases associated with the NJ McPherson Elementary School in Yellowknife last May. After self-isolation requirements relaxed in June, travel picked up considerably, with increase, which increased the importation risk to the NWT. The August 2021 outbreak began in the Satu region with a hand games tournament. Since then, there have been multiple regions with community transmission. The result, over 1,900 cases, 56 hospitalizations, 19 ICU admissions, and very sadly, 12 deaths among NWT residents. I know everyone around this table tonight feels the weight of these past months and the toll it's taken on residents in many communities. It's important to update, sorry. It's important to update members tonight so that we can reflect upon the most recent outbreak and our response to it. The health system responded in robust and innovative ways and staff have done a tremendous job providing care and case management for individuals with COVID-19. Thanks to the collective efforts of our healthcare staff, Indigenous and community leaders and the public for following public health orders and guidance, the number of cases has now dropped considerably across the NWT. 
However, there is still an ongoing outbreak in Tuktoyaktuk and active cases in several other NWT communities. In the meantime, NWT residents are stepping up once again, this time to receive booster doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. The booster will help reduce the risk of severe outcomes. As you know, on Friday last week, Health Canada approved the Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. This means that soon we will be able to vaccinate and protect an even greater portion of the population. I'm sure this is welcome news for everyone. Even as we finally head into winter, we must remain on top of the risks and our responses. COVID-19 cases continue to occur and they are rising in the rest of Canada. As more people gather indoors during this season, the Delta variant will continue to spread. As we've seen, a few cases can quickly grow to become an outbreak. So it's important to continue to follow the public health orders and guidance to help limit the spread of COVID-19. Mr. Chair, I'd now like to turn to Dr. Candola to take us through the presentation on the outbreak response, and then I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Keith, uh, thanks very much, uh, Minister Green. Um, just before I turn it over to Dr. Kendall, I know that uh, uh, we're joined now by phone um, with the uh, Emily for Nanakput, uh, Jackie Jacobson. So just wanted to recognize Jackie's with us this evening as well. So I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Kendola, who I guess you have a presentation for us. We do have the slides up, I think, in the room here and for our, our viewers. So I'd like to turn it over now to Dr. Kendola. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for everyone for joining us this evening. We have the next slide, please. Tonight, I will provide an update on the NWT COVID-19 situation, and we will discuss our outbreak response over the past several months. This will include looking at both the public health orders and our response and health operations response. We'll then talk about some of the recent actions taken, the lessons learned from this most recent outbreak experience before briefly touching upon the landscape as we look ahead. Next slide, please. As we know, prior to May 2021, we had seen a very low number of cases associated with travel and some occasional clusters. With strong public health measures, travel restrictions, and self-isolation requirements, we had managed to avoid the widespread community transmission seen in other jurisdictions, along with severe health outcomes and hospitalizations. In May 2021, there was an elementary school outbreak at the NJ McPherson School in Yellowknife. Despite exposures within the school setting and subsequent household transmission, once again, there was not widespread community transmission outside the school population and their household contacts. In mid-August 2021, a handful of cases in the SAR 2 quickly grew to many following a large gathering. And soon, there was full community transmission in Colville Lake, Fort Good Hope, and Norman Wells. In response, containment orders were put in place quickly and rapid response teams were sent to test widely and identify and isolate cases. Soon after, cases were found in Yellowknife and a number of high-risk exposures were identified in Yellowknife, and Dilo Deta, and Bechoko. The higher rate of travel between these proximal communities caused ongoing transmission in the region. The NWT grew to have the highest active rate of infections of any province or territory in Canada. In November, there were then new COVID-19 cases in Hay River in the capital of Deche First Nation. And orders were put into place, similar to the gathering restrictions from Illinois and other containment orders, with travel between the two communities strongly discouraged. The measures of community response were successful, and the situation improved in a shorter period than other instances. Most recently, there were new cases in Inuvik, and then a sharp increase in active infections in Takta The infections in Takta were mostly in the young population. 
Not only the overall active COVID-19 infections in the Northwest Territories has decreased significantly, which I will review in the upcoming slide. Next slide, please. As we come off the heels of this most recent outbreak response, and we begin to return to a mostly importation risk model, we can look at what brought us here. While we have had self-isolation requirements since March 2020, once we reached a higher vaccine coverage in emerging wisely 2021, we made the decision to remove, remove self-isolation requirements for fully vaccinated persons on June 21st. This resulted in a predictable uptick in travel, but at a rate not seen before. In August, there was consistently over 3,500 travelers per week coming into NWT. This was occurring at the same time as cases were increasing in southern jurisdictions. Put that in perspective, a quarter of the NWT population traveled over the course of that month. With this high level of travel, the risk of importation of COVID-19 greatly increased and as expected cases incurred. With the spread of a highly transmissible Delta variant, a small number of cases quickly increased at a gathering and that's why exactly what happened in Northwest West Coast. Next slide. As of 9 a.m. on November 22nd, there were now 48 active cases among NWT residents. Overall, since the start of the pandemic, there have been 2,116 confirmed cases of COVID-19, with 1,936 of these cases occurring since mid-August. In terms of severe outcomes, there have been unfortunately been 12 deaths. There have been 60 total hospitalizations since the start of the pandemic, with 56 associated with the most recent outbreaks, and 19 total ICU emissions. Looking at the bottom graph, you can see that testing has stepped up greatly to identify cases, with a huge number of positives being identified through September and October. We continue to monitor wastewater in the major centers to determine the level of spread. Through this outbreak, we have seen very high spikes in the wastewater signals in Norman Wells, Bedrock, and Yellowknife, given the high number of active infections in the short time span. Signals have now returned to predictable levels, and the Norman Wells current signal can be attributed to a single case. Next slide, please. As mentioned, as of yesterday at 9 a.m., there are 48 active cases of COVID-19 in six communities across the NWT, two active cases in Inuvik, 36 active cases in Faktayak, with some ongoing transmission with households, seven cases in Yellowknife and Gilandera, and one active case each in Norman Wells, Hay River, and Bechapel. And as we can see from the right column of totals, in many communities, a very large share of the population became infected with COVID-19 over the past several months. Next slide, please. Once again, a graph showing the timeline of this outbreak with the number of new cases is demonstrated here. On the left, we can see the sharp increase in the SAR2, and on the right, we can see how new daily Cases have been dropping significantly before this most recent outbreak in Taktaya. Next slide. The outbreak in Taktaya remains a focus at this time. The first case was detected on November 4th, and this, this quickly increased to 111 total cases as of November 22nd. A rapid response team was sent to the community to assist with testing, contact tracing, and isolating positive cases. The active case count has now dropped to 36 as of November 22nd, although there may be many more cases as exit testing continues. We plan to have the containment order to remain in effect until at least November 29th to allow active cases to continue to decline as more people recover. However, we are seeing some ongoing transmission in households with at-risk contacts. We will review and assess the situation before letting the order expire. Next slide, please. 
Over the course of this most recent outbreak, we have issued many public health orders as the situation has warranted. Starting in Fort Good Hope and Cobo Lake, we issued containment orders that shut down non-essential businesses and did not allow for any gatherings outside the home. We found that there was good compliance with the orders in most instances, as well as support for those who were in isolation. This was helpful in avoiding long-term containment, and in most cases, only two orders were required to allow active cases, active case counts to drop and return communities to regular restrictions. In some cases, we have issued restrictions on gatherings initially, but found that due to compliance and ongoing exposures, more stringent restrictions were required. And this was the case in Normal Wells and in Illinois. In the case of Bay Choco, we issued a containment order, but then amended it later to include restrictions of travel in and out of the community based on vaccine status with testing requirements for those who are not fully vaccinated. This was done in response to ongoing travel between Bay Choco and surrounding communities. The Bay Choco containment order was in place for nearly two months, which we understood was difficult, required, was required given the high COVID-19 activity in that community. We issued a territory-wide masking order for indoor public spaces. Previously, this was mostly community-specific measure, but with more movement indoors and infections occurring, even among the vaccinated communities, individuals, we felt it was an important step to take for all communities. The Yellowknife and Dillandetta had originally adopted a less restrictive gathering order, but then this was amended on September 29 to include restrictions on household gatherings and to reduce numbers further. Like On October 22nd, a new NWT-wide gathering order was issued to reduce gathering numbers across the NWT. But to provide businesses and organizations an option to increase numbers with a proof of vaccination system. We plan to have this gathering order in place for the winter and will apply to all NWT communities that are not under a specific gathering restriction order. We have already seen really good uptake on the proof of vaccination approach and a high number of applications to vary to increase numbers. As of November 18, there have been 385 applications received, 357 given exemptions, 273 of these applications are implementing proof of vaccination, and 78 are not. In the case of Hay River, we had issued similar gathering orders to Yellowknife on October 19. We're actually able to lift this order earlier than anticipated on November 7th, as cases dropped significantly. In Inuvik, we had found that cases were mostly associated with elementary school populations, so I had originally closed schools to in-person learning starting November 7th, but amended this on November 16th to allow schools to reopen but still not permitted extracurricular activities to children under 12. That order was lifted last night. So basically, the only remaining community-specific gathering order that remains in place is in Taktayaktak, which is set to stay in place until at least November 29th. Next slide, please. I will now turn this over to Dr. Anne-Marie Peck to review the health operations aspect of the outbreak response. Thank you, Dr. Candola. Good evening, everybody. The health operations response uh, from the Northwest Territories Health and Social Services Authority is based on four tenets of epidemic response. The first being reduce the number of deaths or serious infections. And the actions we take to do these involve the clinical surveillance of positive cases, identification of those at risk. In some cases, we implemented a preemptive transfer for people who are at high risk of having severe COVID or contracting COVID and having numerous risk factors to proactively remove them from their homes or offer them removal from their homes for a safer place to isolate that may be closer to higher level medical care if this was something that they chose. These people underwent close monitoring, frequent surveillance. There's the use of pharma pharmacological therapies for the treatment of COVID-19, identification of high risk household contacts, and certainly the efforts from the inpatient hospitalization teams for those who are unfortunate enough to require hospitalization. The second tenant involves a reduction in the overall number of infections. This is obtained through contact tracing and testing to ensure early isolation is possible, 
workplace testing programs, which I'll speak to in a moment, and significantly, a very successful vaccination rollout that began at the very end of 2020 and continues today. Next slide, please. The third tenet of the epidemic response involves the protection of responders. And THSSA has been involved in vaccination of frontline staff, the provision of personal protective equipment to those who require it and who are in frequent contact with the public, and testing protocols for those who require health care as well as for health care providers themselves to limit the risk of infection happening within our health care facilities and within facilities designed to look after some of our most vulnerable residents. And the fourth tenet involves the recognition and the limitation when possible, the impacts of both the epidemic and the measures to control it may have on individuals, families, and communities. This is a shared responsibility between multiple government and community departments and involves acknowledging and responding to both individual and community anxiety, the economic impact, and possible feelings of stigma or anger, which may affect both individuals and communities as they battle the COVID-19 pandemic. It also involves acknowledging historical trauma, government and health system mistrust in the context of community response, both to the epidemic and to the various layers of the response to it. Next slide, please. Three notable uh, endeavors which have been incredibly successful in the NWT's response to the COVID-19 pandemic is the early rollout of third doses and boosters. Our third dose and booster program began as our initial vaccine rollout did um, with the vaccination of our long-term care facility residents who make up the most vulnerable segment of our population. And moving quickly to providing third doses to those who are immunocompromised and to our elders and booster doses to adults throughout the Northwest Territories. We are now preparing for the rollout of the vaccination program for another segment of the population, children aged five to 11. The teams have been working hard to make sure that when the vaccine arrives in the Northwest Territories, we're ready to get it in to the arms of those who are now eligible. The DETECT NWT program is now implemented in 45 organizations in the Northwest Territories, although not all are live yet. 26 of these are in Yellowknife, seven in Hay River, one in Fort Smith, one in the Tlicho region, and 10 in Anubic. And the DETECT NWT team was also involved in a recent uh, generalized screen of school children in Anubic where 460 students were screened and not a single positive case was detected. I'll now pass back to Dr. Candola who will talk about the school screening program and continue our presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kent. So the at home school screening program has so far been piloted in 13 schools in Yellowknife, Indilo, Beta, Echico, Inuvik, and Takayatak. This program is being offered in settings where there is the highest risk for large scale community spread. These are the territory's largest elementary schools, along with any small school in proximity to large outbreak centers. This program is instrumental in allowing schools to maintain in-person class delivery, as well as allowing all families involved to have confidence that should there be COVID-19 in our schools, it will be detected early. As of November 16th, the program has seen over 1,000 tests completed and reported by our student volunteers. This program resulted in the early identification of COVID-19 cases among students at the East 3 Elementary School in Inuvik, allowed for earlier containment of this infection than would have otherwise been possible. And we do plan to continue to have this program in place for the time being, even as vaccines are being rolled out for this age group. Next slide, please. I will briefly touch upon vaccination, which we continue to see increase. A vaccine rollout began December 31st, 2020 with long-term care residents and then rolled out across small communities, target populations and age groups over the course of the winter. As of this past Saturday, we now have 83% of the population aged 12 and over considered fully vaccinated, with 87% having their first dose. 
There are now only a handful of communities not considered to be in the green with 75% full vaccination. And we will continue to offer first and second doses. Whenever an outbreak occurs in a community, we have offered vaccines when cases occur in a community, and we have seen pretty impressive uptake in many places. With more younger persons testing positive and cases amongst children in Yellowknife, we also began offering the Pfizer vaccines for persons aged 12 to 17. With evidence of waning immunity based on the fact that NWT received the vaccine early in the national rollout, third doses for a specific population and boosted doses for everyone aged 18 and over who had received the second dose six months prior to October, um, six months prior to the second dose, that be all began in October 2021. And as we all know, the Pfizer vaccine has now been approved for children 5 to 11. This will begin rolling now very soon to help protect this large and vaccinated age group and their families and school settings. Next slide, please. Some of the lessons learned throughout the, this most recent outbreak are the following. In several communities, but especially found in Yellowknife, finding solutions for safely isolating the underhealth population is incredibly important to prevent further spread in the community. A small number of cases in the underhealth population grew and resulted in severe outcomes and impacted the provision of shelter services as staff became infected given the close exposure. It is important to identify isolation options in small communities well in advance of cases and prepare. As we knew all along, COVID-19 could find its way to small and remote communities, even with self-isolation requirements for hubs. Creative and culturally safe options as part of the outbreak response are important. For instance, in the SATU, the SATU Renewable Resources Board, the SATU government worked to get more people on the land safely to reduce transmission in crowded homes. It is important to recognize that hospital emissions are not the only impact on the health system. Despite extremely hard work by the health system, testing, contract creation, and isolation capacity can reach a ceiling with an extremely number, high number of cases, as well as the impacts on families within the community that can impact healthcare providers. The overall health status of the individual population and the lack of social determinants of health modifies the impact of communicable disease like COVID-19 by increasing the number of hazards in populations, including exposures to communicable disease increasing the probability of acquiring infections after exposure, and increasing the risk of severe outcomes. This is all too apparent with overcrowded housing in many communities. It is nearly impossible for some people to safely isolate away from other members of the family in some of these settings, which increases the risk of household transmission and exposure to persons who may be vulnerable to severe health outcomes. We've also seen some evidence of waning immunity I mentioned previously. We are reviewing this with the Canadian Immunity Task Force as this could be less than for other jurisdictions as they approach a longer time frame from their initial rollout. Next slide, please. Heading into the winter months, we can predict that the importation risk to the NWT will rise once again with winter and holiday travel picking up. With more people gathering indoors in the rest of Canada too, we can expect cases to rise. As we saw before increased travel to other jurisdictions, where incidence is high, will also increase importation risk and likelihood of seeing more cases over this winter. At the same time, we are seeing vaccination levels rising, including booster doses. So we are, we are seeing a better level of overall protection, which should help prevent severe outcomes. Children five to level will now be eligible to receive the vaccine too, increasing overall population protection. Finally, over the winter months, we will be looking at ways to ensure our capacity to respond and manage outbreaks and to have the right structures in place to do so. This includes transitional planning and looking at what our response looks like when the public health emergency is lifted. I will conclude my presentation here. for appreciate the time to walk you through this outbreak response. We will be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Dr. Kendall, for the presentation. I'm going to turn now to committee members, and I've got a uh, list going here in terms of uh, opportunities for members to ask a question. I'm going to turn first to the member for Montfouy. Uh If you have any questions, I'll, why don't you go ahead first? Do other ones first, and then. <laughs> 
Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Bonnerus, you have any questions? Why don't you go ahead? Thanks. <clears throat> Let's see, Mr. Chair. Must see uh, to the health to the minister and the CPHO for appearing before us tonight and their staff. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, I, I'm just wondering about the workplace testing programs. Um, you didn't quite elaborate on those. I'm just wondering if you could uh, give me some insight or information on that, Masi. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Bonnerouche. Um, perhaps I'll go to Minister Green first, and then if you would like uh, assistance from the, the team in the room, uh, go there, please. Yeah, thanks. Please direct all questions to me and I'll redirect them as needed. So the uh, workplace program is a voluntary and self-administered testing program uh, for businesses and organizations that have a lot of public traffic in them. So a shelter, for example, uh, a grocery store, a restaurant, um, these uh, businesses and nonprofits can organize, uh, can apply to receive antigen tests from uh, NTHSSA and test uh, their workforce two to three times a week uh, to determine whether COVID is, is present in the workforce. And um, I think for additional information on this, I will go to Dr. Pegg. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Minister Green. Dr. Pegg? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Minister Green. Um, as has been described, the Detect NWT program is a voluntary program for workplaces who feel that their employees may be at risk, uh, particularly due to public exposure. It's a program where the testing actually takes place at the work site. Uh, training is provided from NTHSSA to a designated tester or testing teams at the work site. And those who are enrolled in the program, as Minister Green mentioned, uh, are tested with a rapid antigen test several times per week. This is different than the tests that are done at the testing center in the health centers. Um, and they are uh, most accurate when repeated testing happens uh, for a population that may be at a slightly higher risk or even a, a significantly higher risk of exposure to COVID. Um, businesses can apply uh, to NTHSSA for assistance in setting up that program in their workplace if that's something that is of interest to them. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, for that. Uh, uh, Mr. Bonnerouche, uh, second question. Mm. Yeah, must be Mr. Chair. Um, this testing program, is that, um, well, obviously in, the, in a store setting, you would have a staff, a tilt person and uh, stock people running around in there, plus uh, the general population coming in and out. Is, is, I'm not clear on whether the testing is for the unvaccinated or, or what's, what's the whole purpose and scenario for doing this testing, must see. I see, Mr. Bonnerouge, uh, I'll go back to Minister Green. Yeah, thank you. Um, the, uh, the point of the testing is to pick up asymptomatic uh, COVID in, in um, high traffic situations. Uh, so it, it doesn't depend on the vaccine status. And um, it, it doesn't involve the customers or clients of the organization. It's specifically for the staff of the organization to use as um, an early testing, early warning uh, device for the presence of COVID in the workforce. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Pegg? Thanks, uh, Minister Green, Dr. Pegg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, that's a, a very good explanation of the intention of the program. Uh, it's to uh, detect early introductions of COVID-19 infection potentially into the staff of a workplace and assist that staff member and that workplace in isolating uh, that individual and preventing any potential spread or at least limiting any potential spread to the people who would be coming into that business. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thanks for that. Um, can someone just tell us quickly how many uh, businesses or workplaces have you already signed up? Thanks. Yeah, I heard uh, Dr. Candola say that it was 46, or that might have been Dr. Pegg who said it was 46, but some of them may not yet be implemented. They've, been, they've signed up. They receive a small amount of training uh, and the testing supplies and off they go. Okay, thanks. I was probably asleep at the wheel. Um, thanks for that. Uh, next on my list is uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the presenters. I, firstly, I want to I th thank you. I think the Detect NWT work is great work. Uh, I, the more surveillance we can get out here, the better. I also want to thank the staff for the rollout of the vaccine passport. I've been to a number of restaurants now where they've asked for it, and it, it's been very easy and smooth, and I, I think people, people feel much safer knowing that the entire people, everyone in those restaurants is fully vaccinated. So congratulations and thank you for that work. I, I guess my question is, to what what are the triggers we need to stop, you know, treating outbreaks with the tools we've been using to date, which are, you know, the limiting gatherings, limiting restrictions. I, I, I mean, I, I, I would welcome an understanding, but my understanding is that it, it is likely we are going to see cases again in the Northwest Territories, and after Christmas break, after the travel. Uh, another outbreak is very much possible. Uh, it doesn't seem that we are quite through this. And I'm just wondering if if we get to that point again where we have cases increasing in any community, and I know they're happening in Tuck right now, or happening again in Yellowknife, do we envision using the same kind of lockdown effect tools? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Minister Green. Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, I'll turn this question over to the CPHO. Thank you. Thanks, Minister Green. Uh, Dr. Candola. So, currently, 70% of our total population is fully vaccinated. With the approval of the vaccines for the 5 to 11 year olds, this is welcome news because um, at this point we have about 7,000 children and 12 who are not yet eligible for vaccines. And elementary schools remain our largest cohort of unvaccinated um, NWT residents. But um, we hope that we're rolling out the vaccines is that uh, we will get outbreaks, we'll, we'll have um, case imported cases, but we will not get the same level of widespread um, community transmission if we get a successful uptake in this population. When you look at how this, um, from mid-August all the way to now, how this COVID uh, Delta variant traveled, is uh, it went right for the under-vaccinated regions. So our lowest vaccine regions were the Satu and the Quicho. And when it came to the larger regional centers, it went for the under-vaccinated populations, which were our shelter users, under house, and we were starting to see importation in school settings. And this was consistent with what we saw in Hay River and in Inuvik. Um, Thankfully, um, our most vulnerable um, uh, residents are have been vaccinated uh, or have uh, received um, natural immunity from COVID. And so the last, last cohort where we could see a significant rise in the population would be elementary school kids. So if we roll that out and depend on the uptake, um, I don't anticipate we'll see the same widespread community transmission. We don't see that same widespread community transmission. It's unlikely that I would be needed to use these um, restrictive orders um, to contain the spread. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Kendall. Uh, um, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, I think we all hope that we do not need to go back to those restrictive orders. I, I, I understand and I'm happy to see the rollout for uh, ages five and up, I think that's great. Can I just uh, get an understanding of whether there are any plans anywhere to have a vaccine for five and under? Or I, I actually just don't have an understanding of whether that's in the works or something that would be considered, or whether we're going to continue to maintain distinctions for people who are children, I guess, under five on vaccination status. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Johnson, Minister Green. 
Yeah, thank you. I have not heard about clinical trials on uh, children five years. Well, I guess it would be zero to four years. But uh, I'll ask Dr. Kendall for uh, an answer on this. Thanks, Mr. Green. Dr. Kendall. So thankfully, uh, Pfizer has um, undertaken three clinical trials. So their first um, in the population of the 12. The first trial was for kids 5 to 11 which is one third the dose of um, adult um, dosage. And then the se second trial was from kids from two to under five. And that's one tenth of uh, the adult adolescent advisor dose. And then the third trial was uh, six months to two years. Um, the results for the, the last two trials, it's unlikely that they will be submitted for, to Health Canada for um, review. Um, in 2021, they'll likely be submitted in uh, 2022, uh, and it would take them a month or two to review that data. So we will not um, be receiving any information on the approval of vaccines for two to five and six months to two years, probably till the second quarter, likely, of 2022. However, um, we are in the midst of reviewing uh, I travel restrictions orders uh, specifically for that population as well. And so there'll be some anticipated uh, changes um, around that population. They would still need to isolate, they still won't be able to um, attend daycares um, if they're traveling out of territory, but there will be a lot more relaxation on their um, isolation requirements around out of territory travel. And as we move forward to the spring of 2022, um, having that population vaccinated would not be a criteria for lifting the public health order. Uh, the criteria would be looking at what the total case count is and improving that vaccine coverage, but it wouldn't be relied on the under five getting vaccinated. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to uh, Emily Semler. Thank you, uh, Minister, and to the Chief Public Health Officer and all the staff there for your presentation. Um, today we, you know, I mean, yesterday we heard that we are having to close s units in our hospital and in, in our capital here because of staffing shortage. This brought to light concerns with as my you know as we know that we're continually having struggles with our staffing and my concern is is that our covid the nurses were doing contact tracing working within that area you know you've given us the stats that we've had 1900 cases so there's been a lot of contact tracing there's been a lot of work behind the scenes and i'm just wondering if this nursing shortage is going to is impacting our ability within the health authority to do this job or and are we having any foreseen interruptions or concerns with our staffing okay thanks uh emily summer uh minister green yeah thank you uh, i'll ask um the CEO of NTHSSA, Kim Riles, to answer this question, please. Okay, thanks, uh, Minister Green. Uh, Ms. Riles. Uh, thank you, Minister Green, and thank you, Emily Sama, for the question. Um, it was uh, certainly, certainly we are concerned as we look forward in terms of our ability to continue to recruit uh, qualified healthcare providers in the NWT. Um, as we know, as you know, this has been a longitudinal issue within the NWT. We've always been challenged uh, to be able to recruit. Um, in view of the worsening um, projections around the health workforce uh, nationally and short shortages of staff that we're seeing um, throughout the country, this is certainly something that's very high on our radar. Um, and certainly we've been working closely with um, with our colleagues in the GWT, and Department of uh, Finance, HR, Department of Health and Social Services, to ensure that we are closely monitoring and being able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, respond and continue to be innovative in our recruitment approaches. 
So in terms of our immediate ability to, to maintain contact tracing services, uh, we've been able to do a significant amount of work, particularly through this latest round of outbreaks, to redesign our public health approach to make sure we're being the most efficient and effective that we can, to be able to put um, systems and processes in place that will allow us to support virtual contact tracing work, so that even, for example, right now with the cases that are occurring in TAC, uh, we have the YK outbreak team supporting uh, and do virtual contact tracing activities to support that team on the ground. So it allows us to be more flexible with our resources and to be able to you know, use all resources as territorial resources, which is a helpful, a helpful uh, approach. But um, I don't want to diminish the concerns that the member raises because certainly we know that you know, we do have to be very vigilant around our ongoing ability to recruit uh, qualified healthcare providers and nurses and community. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Riles. I'll go back to uh, Emily somewhere. Yes, thank you, uh, and and thank you for that. And and I, and I, yeah, it is a concern, and throughout Canada, and it, it is something that we need to be be, be mindful of. Um, I'm just going to switch over a little bit to the uh, the concern that. I raised, uh, I think in the past, is just the transfer of um, immunization between, and, I, and I've heard it between healthcare staff that are come, trying, uh, that are coming, the documentation, because now that we're required to have a QR code, so if you're having a vaccine in one area, for instance, say you had your first vaccine here in the Northwest Territories, and then you have your vaccine in another territory. I think the Northwest Territories has made it so that if it's not an NWT healthcare card, you can still access it online. But Alberta, uh, BC, if you're not, if you don't have an NW, Alberta healthcare or a BC healthcare, you can't go on to their systems and access their. Um, to print your uh, immunization record if you received a vaccine. So, will it, and, and I'm just wondering if that has been cleared up or if there's been any work within the provinces to try and straighten that out so it makes it easier across Canada, wherever you get your vaccine, you punch in your healthcare number and you can produce your QR code because that is, that I mean, I had to get on a plane to get here and in Inuvik, I didn't even think I needed it. They asked for my QR code paper. My card were not good enough that I received from public health, so it, it, it is going to start becoming an issue. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Emily Semler. I'll go to uh, Ms. Green. Yeah, thank you. We are aware of, uh, of issues where people have vaccines in, juris in different jurisdictions, and it can be difficult to uh, to amalgamate uh, the information into into one place. I'm going to ask um, the Deputy Minister if he wants to add anything on here, because this is not a problem that's unique to the NWT. It could happen in, in almost any jurisdiction. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mr. Green. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Yes, so um, the proof of vaccine credential that, uh, that we have uh, developed and implemented is consistent with the same standard that's used throughout Canada. Uh, and uh, there may be circumstances where individuals would have had one dose here and another dose in another jurisdiction. At the current time, people would have to carry the proof from both NWT and say Alberta in, uh, in, uh, as an example. Uh, and that because they are all meeting the uh, standard for uh, proof of vaccine required for travel, uh, the, um, that would work for people. Uh, we, are, we have been getting some requests from people who would uh, like to be able to have the vaccine they had delivered in Alberta, as an example, entered into their EMR record here in the NWT and then converted to one record uh, one proof of vaccine and one uh, code. And that is something that um, is being looked at, is being scoped as uh, something that we, uh, we, to understand what work would be involved. 
there is certainly uh, an extra bit of workload for staff to have to do the, the data entry uh, and to be sure that what we've received from another jurisdiction isn't fraudulent. It's actually a legitimate uh, proof of vaccine. So this is something that's being uh, looked at. Uh, but I think the good news is that the proof of vaccine model that has rolled out is even if it is inconvenient for people to have to have two proofs in their, uh, on their phone, uh, it is a valid approach. Thank you. Yep, thanks uh, for that. Uh, um, sounds interesting, it sounds like we need a national system, but um, I'm gonna go to uh, Emily Jacobson, you're on the phone. Uh, any questions, Mr. Jacobson? Might be muted. Okay. Mr. Chair, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I'd just like to thank uh, Minister and her staff for um, the presentation tonight. Uh, I have, uh, I would like to know the vaccinations for the 5 to 11 year olds in the schools and what time would uh, I heard her say, correct me if I'm wrong, about uh, them coming up into the riding of uh, Nanakput and in, in our writing to see what time uh, a timeline is uh, that would happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yep, thanks, uh, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, we'll go to Minister Green. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's my understanding that the vaccine will be here towards the end of the week and that a schedule for distributing it has been developed and it will be made public uh, once we have the vaccine in hand um, and, and we can firm up the plans. I'll just uh, see if uh, Dr. Pegg has anything she wants to add to that in terms of uh, the timing, um, how long it's going to take to do the first dose throughout the, the communities, whether that work can be done by Christmas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Minister Green. I think there were CBC stories as well about the first supplies arriving in Canada this past weekend, but Dr. Pegg, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yes, so we are anticipating the arrival of the vaccine in the territory in the coming days. And the vaccination teams have been preparing since we were made aware of uh, the impending Health Canada approval to make sure that storage requirements and training requirements were done um, in every area of the territory so that staff are prepared to roll it out. And as Minister Green mentioned, uh, there will be a plan communicated to each community by the health centre uh, or the public health department once we know the exact date of arrival of that vaccine. Um, but health centres and the vaccine logistics team and the vaccine administration team have been working very hard to make sure that we're ready to roll out within a very short time after the arrival of the vaccine. Depending, of course, on uh, weather and air charters as we do get into that time of year where sometimes we experience certain feelings. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Pegg. Uh, uh, Mr. Jacobson, you, you have a second question? Yeah, uh, just to follow up, uh, Mr. Chair, um, the, I asked about the uh, timeline. Are they going to be hitting the COVID hotspots, I guess, so to say, in a, or are they going to be doing every, like yellow knife and working their way out? Or are they going to come into Nanakfoot or Inuvik or you know, to the places uh, Fort Good Hope to do the uh, 5 to 11. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Jacobson. Uh, anything you can, any insights you can share with us about the scheduling? Um, I'll go to Minister Green. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I'll go to uh, Dr. Pegg. She'll have a sense of how that is uh, working. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Minister Green. Uh, Dr. Pegg. Yes, the idea is to have the vaccine distributed to each community and region in the territory within a relatively short period of time so that health centre staff um, can commence their rollout plans, whether that be in schools or by other means. Um, the vaccine rollout for this particular product will be slightly different um, in that it won't be community by community with a separate vaccine team arriving, um, but in the majority of places it will be rolled out um, by health centre staff with the support as needed um, by the vaccination team. Um, once we again have a 
have an idea of when that product is arriving, then everyone will have an idea of when it will be available for the children in their community. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Pegg. Uh, we're going to move on to um, Emily Simpson, who's in the room here with us. Hey, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I thank you for that presentation. Uh, I think we have to get together a little more often, and because uh, it's usually informative. Uh, I guess the first uh, issue I, I want to bring up is uh, now that we're getting into winter and. Uh, we're seeing uh, more uh, indoor activities, I guess, and outdoor in terms of skiing and uh, like we're in hockey and and uh, curling and figure skating. Uh, one of the issues that I guess come up in Hay River and I guess in other communities as well is that there, there was a vote on, you know, uh, who could uh, enter the uh, sports facilities. And uh, right now, you I guess you've got to be vaccinated if uh, if you're over the age of 12 and uh, to get in. But I'm wondering if, and, and I guess the other thing here is that the communities rely on your advice and your direction when they make their decision. And is there any way or is there something that, be, that can be done to uh, accommodate those that are partially or unvaccinated, uh, like testing and uh, hockey, for instance, if you've got a, uh, a face shield on, uh, to allow them to participate uh, in sports? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emily Simpson. I'll go to Minister Green. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the uh, there's kind of two different things going on here. One is the gathering limit that is part of Emerging Wisely, which is uh, under the direction of the CPHO. The other is uh, vaccine mandates set out by municipalities, businesses, other entities. Um, which uh, the CPHO is not involved in. So, um, you know, if the question is about how the town of Hay River is applying its vaccine mandate, um, to the best of my knowledge, that, that would really be up to the town of Hay River to figure out whether they're going to accommodate residents with testing and, and through other means. Did you want to add anything uh, to that, Dr. Kendall? Thanks, uh, Minister Green. Dr. Candola. So, the, for the gathering order, it's a default um, gathering limit is 25 indoors and 50 outdoors. And any business organization can apply um, online to vary. The difference is if you do, do use a proof of vaccine as part of your application, it does allow a higher number of participants. The only exception to gatherings are high risk activities and high risk activities do include um, indoor winter activities like hockey, curling, bigger skating that as you talk about, um, indoor singing, hand games, um, use of musical uh, wind, wind instruments. What we do know is that with some specific activities we do ask um, exposure plan be outlined and if people are using proof of vaccine for some of those sports um, it allows uh, more risk or activities but if they choose not to then there is a, a limitation of what people can do and how they can just avoid further transmission. We do know that with some of these high risk activities um, one case can quickly spread to an outbreak so it's, it's that balance of um, allowing an increase in gathering, but allowing it to be safer. And if uh, proof of vaccine is not part of what a municipality chooses, it's just smaller numbers. Okay, thanks, Dr. Kendall. I'll, I'll go back to, uh, oh, sorry, Emily Simpson, you've had your one, or did you get two? I think you're on your second one. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, the second question, I guess, is uh, with the uh, number of exposures uh, and spikes here over the last month, what has this done? Has there been an impact on routine and specialized surgeries at uh, at Stanton? Have you know? Have we like? Are we behind uh, 
on 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 uh, providing uh, surgeries to to people in the territories and and if we are uh, what type and uh, like how far behind would we be thank you thanks Emily Simpson uh, Minister Green yeah thank you I'll ask uh, Tim Riles to answer this question please um, go ahead uh, Ms Riles yeah, thank you Mr um, there was a period of time where we had suspended uh, elective surgeries uh, in this recent outbreak, um, as well as for a number of other periods, uh, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, we have continued with urgent uh, and obviously emergency surgeries, as well as high priority types of surgery like cancer care throughout, and have never actually caused those. Um, unlike some other jurisdictions uh, where there were further uh, scale back of, of procedures happening. Um, I don't have available exact numbers of uh, procedures uh, that have been deferred, uh, but some of the approach that we, were t we have taken has actually been that we shortened our booking timeline so there wouldn't have necessarily been cancelled procedures, uh, but would have been perhaps um, not, uh, we, we just weren't booking as far, as far ahead to avoid uh, these types of cancellations. So um, there was a very rapid uh, resumption once we saw hospitalization numbers start to diminish um, on the tail end of the of the outbreak activity when we were seeing our peak hospitalization. So we were actually able to ramp up again quite quickly. But um, there have been uh, some persons who have uh, experienced delays for sure. Okay, thanks, uh, Ms. Riles. I'll uh, go on now to uh, Ms. Cleveland, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> and thank you very much uh, to the Minister of Health and her team for the presentation. Um, there's going to be a lot of very happy parents out there to hear that the Pfizer vaccine is expected to arrive on, on Friday and hopefully a quick rollout from there. And also with this evening's announcement that children who have received the first dose uh, will no longer be required to, to isolate. And so that's, that's pretty exciting news. Um, I'm wondering if the minister or her team can, can speak to how um, school restrictions will change once children are, are vaccinated, um, either partially or, or fully. Um, and I'm also wondering if there is um, an, an expectation that uh, there is a, a school vaccine mandate or if that is in the in the works with, or if they've heard from school boards as well. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emily Cleveland. I think you managed to squeeze about three questions in there. So <laughs> I'm gonna go to uh, Minister Green. Yeah, thanks. I just wanna clarify, first of all, um, that the self-isolation for the five to 11 year old um, is only waived 13 days after their their first shot so it's not immediate the, there needs to be a period of time where the where the child starts developing antibodies and during that time uh if they've been outside of the territory uh they'll have a couple of tests to confirm that they are negative um in terms of the the questions about school operations i'm I, I kind of think that those are up to ECE, but it is possible that the CPHO provides advice on that point. So I'll ask Dr. Candola if she has anything to add here. Thank you. Thanks, Minister Green. Dr. Candola. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the Minister. So the, our office maintains a very tight relationship with ECE. We have uh, weekly calls um, with the ADM and our senior staff. Uh, what we do anticipate uh, is that when we start to see an increased uptake in the five to uh, 11 year olds is um, less children having COVID, uh, less introductions to the school system and, and less dis disruption. Um, at this point, uh, nationally, um, uh, the case count is well over um, 2000 and we are going into the dead of winter and we are anticipating to see um, cases go up a little bit with waning immunity in other jurisdictions. So COVID is still an importation risk. Um, we have um, these, the self-isolation requirements has stated for the five to 11 year olds. So it's two weeks after the first dose. Um, 
and up to eight weeks after the first dose, uh, children can be exempted from self-isolation from out of territory travel with a day one and day eight test. And, but we still feel given the um, long time it will take for children to um, increase to a level of protective immunity that some uh, the school restrictions still need to uh, stay in place, such as the bubbled classrooms, the um, uh, unidirectional seating, dedicated um, seats, as well as the indoor masking, specifically during the winter. But what we do anticipate is that if we do have introductions of COVID-19, is that in the elementary school system, we no longer have to have the whole class um, uh, isolate them on the, for 10 days. Um, we would um, specifically look at the unvaccinated children uh, for that. So there'd be less school disruption, both in terms of less kids having COVID and less kids having to isolate in a classroom because of COVID. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Kendola. Um, I'm gonna go back to uh, Emily uh, Cleveland. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. I, I guess one of my concerns is um, the reintroduction of things like drama uh, and, and sports teams and gym classes to our school environments. Uh, for some kids, this is primarily where they have access to these things and, and is definitely um, a needed mental health outlet for our children. Um, my next question is in regards to self-isolation plans and permission to, to work documents for fully vaccinated Northerners. And I'm wondering if the requirements to complete these uh, administrative pieces is going to be changed, reduced, and potentially removed in the near future. Thank you. Thanks, Emily Cleveland, uh, Minister Green. Uh, yeah, the simple answer to this is that the self-isolation plans are tied to the public health orders. So as long as we uh, are in a public health emergency with public health orders, we're going to be continuing to use uh, self-isolation plans. Okay, thanks, uh, Minister Green. Um, Ms. Nockleby. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you to everyone for the presentation. I know it's been a long day. Um, my question, I guess the biggest one I'm sort of getting now, or people seem to be the most passionate about, is sort of the, the legalities of the uh, uh, passport or sorry, the proof of uh, vaccination. So um, I'm just wondering, is it possible to have uh, an outline of the legal opinion uh, around um, whether or not th this is allowed to be done for public servants? Um, specifically around Section 7 of the Charter. I've just had some constituents reaching out to see if that would be possible. And while I'm guessing that may not be, if it isn't, could uh, there be some explanation of sort of the legalities around this and the talking points? Because I'm finding it very difficult as an MLA to explain that to constituents um, and they, as they feel their, their rights have been infringed on. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Emily Knockleby. I'll go to Minister Green. Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Um, the vaccine mandate for the public service is from the Department of Finance, Human Resources, and any legal opinion they have on uh, on the vaccine mandate would have to be obtained from them. It's it's not part of the Department of Health. Okay, thanks, uh, Minister Green. Uh, uh, Ms. Nalkaby? All right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, no, I have no further questions. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, over to uh, Emily Whalen Armstrong. Okay. Um, thank you for doing the report. Um, I just want to ask um, vaccine update. They were talking about vaccine update. Do they have any status on the regions regarding vaccine? Thanks, uh, Emily Whalen Armstrong. Uh, I think the there's the COVID dashboard and it's updated every week, but I'm gonna turn to uh, Minister uh, Green uh, to answer, thanks. 
Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, that's right. The vaccine, uh, the vaccine statistics by community are available uh, online on the COVID dashboard, and they are updated uh, once a week on Monday. And so I, um, I, I don't have the numbers for your region in front of me, but I can look them up and send them to you after this. Okay, thanks, uh, Minister Green. As I understand, it's kind of like a part of a national protocol and system. It's updated once a week uh, across the country. Each jurisdiction does their own kind of tracking, but uh, it's all done nationally. But um, Emily, Whale, and Armstrong, uh, go ahead if you have a second question. No, no, it's just that's okay. All right. Um, any burning questions from any members before we wrap this up? Uh, Emily Cleveland, you got, I know, a few more. Why don't you, you uh, we'll give you one more bonus question. Thank you so much, Emma, or Emma, sorry, Mr. Chair. Must be my lucky Tuesday. I'm wondering uh, if the minister can speak to intent to work on a lessons learned document um, or if there are any plans um, that they have heard from the Auditor General of Canada to kind of do a consolidation of uh, lessons learned throughout the pandemic uh, throughout Canada and if health intends to participate in any kind of such activities uh, in the life of this assembly. Thank you. Thanks, Emily Cleveland. Uh, Minister Green. Yeah, last week uh, when uh, the Executive Council met with the NWT Council of Leaders, uh, there was um, a commitment to do a lessons learned exercise with the Indigenous governments regarding outbreak management in the NWT. So a special working group will be struck for that purpose to do that lessons learned exercise. I'm unaware of any national efforts to do lessons learned, but I'll just check in now with the Deputy Minister to see whether he's aware of uh, a national focus on, on lessons learned. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Minister Green. Uh, uh, Deputy Minister, uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much. No, I, I'm not uh, aware of any formalized plans for our lessons learned, particularly through the Auditor General of Canada. We've, we've not had discussions at the deputy table about uh, their engagement in that. Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, very much for that. And of course, Emily Cleland, you, I'm sure you can come to a future public accounts uh, or a school goal meeting where we'll uh, actually be meeting with uh, folks from the uh, Auditor General's office and I'm sure they, they can share some any insights there with you directly as well. Um, I know uh, Emily Bonnerouche has his hand up as well, so I'm going to let uh, Mr. Bonnerouche have the last question unless anybody else has any burning ones and then I think we need to wrap this up because it's been a very long day. Uh, Emily Bonnerouche, please go ahead. Merci, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, I just want to touch base on the importation risk <clears throat> since we have a lot of that happening. Um, specifically, the long haul truckers because um, I don't know if the trucking industry is regulated uh, during this vaccination period because um, uh, we don't know ourselves uh, their process or whether they're vaccinated and they're coming into our communities uh, offloading groceries and whatnot. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, if they're being checked or or anything and if the border our border services is still functioning, Masi. Thanks, uh, Emily Bonnet Rouge. I'll go to Minister Green. Yeah, thank you. The um, border controls will be in place until the public health emergency ends, uh, along with the self isolation plan requirement, for example. Uh, so uh, there are still people. Um, uh, at the airports and at the land borders uh, who are making sure that people have filed uh, self-isolation plans coming in. Um, I believe the long-haul truckers are covered as essential workers in terms of the requirements um, for uh, disclosing where they've been and, and that kind of thing. So 
Uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Candola if she has any uh, any information about um, whether whether uh, the long haul trucker importation risk is controlled by the SIP or whether there's some other way of uh, controlling that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Minister Green, uh, Dr. Candola. Thank you. So in the travel restriction self-isolation order, um, supply chain um, are, are exempted for a certain duration of time. They are logged in when they come in, but they are subjected to um, the same public health measures as other um, residents, such as mandatory um, indoor masking. Um, and we did provide a specific uh, social distancing information um, targeted to long haul drivers around uh, physical distancing, contactless um, um, use of uh, pick, picking up the gas. If they're, when they're in um, the store, they are required to wear a mask. Um, specifically for MLA Bonner Rouge, what I do urge um, everyone as we are um, um, going through the long winter, it's really important that you actually encourage your own uh, residents to be fully vaccinated. If they're eligible for a booster, it's been their adults and it's been six months since their second dose, um, encourage people to get a booster uh, and encourage healthy habits. This is, people can protect themselves. Um, it, it's um, long haul truckers, um, typically uh, their own trucking companies may be requiring them to be vaccinated as part of their um, employment services. I know the ice road truckers here we were requiring testing and, and full vaccination when they're um, um, during the ice road season. But all in all, people travel in and out all the time. And it's important that we are, take responsibility for our own risk, specifically when you go COVID endemic. And so for, for Providence, uh, increase your vaccine um, coverage, I encourage boosters, um, be supportive of the five to 11 rollout. And then, um, uh, be compliant with the other activities as indoor masking, uh, small gatherings, and um, um, getting tested if you're sick. This is what's going to keep people protected. Four Province has been doing an amazing job so far. Um, with the travel restrictions and self-isolation order, um, just to respond back to MLA Cleveland, there will be an update and streamlining of that order expected in um, mid-December. So um, we, uh, we'll probably have another AOC on this. In the future. Okay. Thanks uh, very much. Uh, let's let's uh, end it here. I know everybody's had a long day. Um, Want to thank uh, Minister and uh, Chief Public Health Officer for uh, joining us this evening. The other staff uh, over there, where you folks are, uh, we've got staff in the room here as well that we've been holding up. So uh, want to thank everybody for joining us and watching uh, tonight. And uh, thanks and uh, rest up for tomorrow. <laughs>